Welcome back, final episode. Since our blower door test, we've completed the house and you know we've done our insulation, final layer, linings, paint, joinery. And now we've finished the final piece of the puzzle and that is the mechanical ventilation system. So we know we've got a certain amount of cubic meters in the house now. We've had the blow door test, we've got 0.2. So we have a very, very little amount of air leaking in this house. Passive house standard is 0.6, so the increase in performance is huge there. And now we can easily manage that air in this environment because it's so airtight. So the mechanical ventilation system is, can just work efficiently 24 hours a day in the background, just supplying and extracting that air, filtering it, supply extract and you just turn it on and let it do its job in a, in a normal house with openable windows as you open a window on one side and on the other side and the air passes all the way through and and that's kind of what happens so in a in a high performance house that's airtight um, like a passive house we have to do this mechanically so we inject fresh air into the bedrooms and into the living rooms Effectively that becomes a positive pressure zone and that spills out into your hallways and it travels down into your wet rooms uh, which is your bathrooms, your laundry, your kitchen and they are negative pressure zones so we're drawing air out of those locations all of the time. So that's 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Uh, those areas become negative pressure so any moisture in those locations is contained in those locations and also removed. So the ventilation unit will extract from your wet rooms, it'll bring all of that back to the unit, it'll recover or strip the heat out of that, it'll send the heat across to the incoming air supply, but the moisture just passes outside, it just disappears. So I'm commissioning this MVHR unit. Um, so right now I'm going around and measuring the air speeds. So I'm just getting an average reading what's coming out of every single extract and intake. And a reading on the master bedroom over here. Um, the master bedroom came through at 16 on um, my reading. And right here, according to Steve Leltron, we're looking to achieve 30. And then we'll carry this out across the whole house. Re getting the readings of what we got have what we have now and then we will adjust each dropper to achieve the right reading all right 19. if we look at all of the living spaces and the air volumes being injected into those spaces versus the wet rooms and all of the uh, return air volumes added together those two total bottom line values must be the same and what that means is that we're not pressurizing the house and we're not depressurizing the house. But also what's happening with the heat exchanger core is that the same volume of air is passing through the heat exchanger core on both sides. And that gives us our maximum heat recovery efficiency. You know, doing uh, higher levels of air tightness and um, higher levels of insulation, higher performance windows for that matter, um, those are pillars and one of the pillars is also your heat recovery ventilation so they all work together to get this high level of comfort that we're desiring so um, you can do one thing or the other but really what you need to do is do all of them together thinking about the insulation being continuous and thermal bridge free from when we design it all the way through to when we complete the, the structure and that goes the same for the air tightness um, and that goes the same throughout the whole building process so as you can see if we don't do this correctly that's not going to work as well or if, so if we don't do the air tightness and vapor barrier correctly, 
uh, insulation over time will um, deteriorate. And if the home is an airtight, then mechanical and ventilation isn't going to work efficiently. So all of those five principles are all complementing each other. One's not working solely like on its own. So you can see this idea of continuity between the, the, the principles and passive house standard it also applies in the planning and design phase with the relationships between each party. You know, you've got your builder, you've got the owner, the architect, uh, those parties complement each other at the initial design phase. Like how is the design going to reach the standard or be energy efficient? Um, how's it going to be built? How are we going to get the mechanical ventilation services throughout the home? Um, say, for example, here at Moonlight's a two-story and we've got to get all our ductwork into each room through a mid-floor, so that's where we use the posi strut floor so without the builder being on board early the likelihood of reaching the standard is at risk um, as well as you know without a certified um, designer using phpp you're you're probably going to miss some of those key areas so a lot of people ask that why did you use posi strut flooring and why do we recommend it to clients? It is, you know, known as a bit more of an expensive um, floor joist system. If you look up there and see what we've been able to achieve and how much easier our subtrades job is with this flooring system, they're not drilling any holes. It's easy to run their cables, their pipes, and just knowing that I don't need to worry about my subs drilling holes anywhere because there is endless opportunity for them <laughs> to run all their services. The floor system, the supply of Posi Strap might be a little bit more expensive, but your, your cost savings for your builder and project management is huge because you know I'm not having to worry about where these ducts and plumbing and supplies and where our subs drill holes is going I just know that they have have the room to do it all so the cost savings for me is in your builders project management having a builder involved in the process as early as possible is um, a really good thing from a cost perspective the later in the process and the design process that you uh, make changes or even in the construction process the more expensive it's going to be so uh, just naturally through administration costs and rework and things like that so having a builder involved in the process early can identify uh, details within the drawings where it might not be possible like from a buildability perspective and then also find efficiencies in, in designs for building. The upfront cost is very small to get a builder involved in a, in a few design meetings and it can have a big impact on like a compounding effect on the price at the end of the job so it's highly beneficial. So you can see how continuity is an idea um, runs through throughout building to the passive house standard from start to finish just from planning to in the design to execution um, to completion and then it continues on afterwards once you're living in the house and you start to see how the home is working to its modelling, you know, you're, you're in winter, you're getting that low sun, you still have it, well, this home, we still have a heating demand of 21 kilowatt hours per square metre. So we, we still have some heating. And then you're, you're seeing how that modelling works and how that, th those windows bring in that low sun into the house and then warm up the space for a limited time in, in, in winter. But then, okay, so, I need to time my heating to um, 
to cater for my heating demand in those shaded hours. And, and you just work out, slowly you work out the more efficient way to be living in the home. We've um, installed a solar system with a Tesla battery on the home. So uh, on this property, we've got 14 Hyundai 390 watt panels. Um, obviously it's a really high performance home. And so we've looked at some of the modeling and we've created our own modeling about its energy demand. Typical home in New Zealand, or I suppose in, in Queenstown, we're installing probably a slightly higher than that, kind of 18 to 24 panels um, with a battery setup. But in this um, situation, the demand in the property is quite low because it's so efficient. And so we've started off with a smaller array that we're confident will cover um, the demand and have ample access to charge that battery in the day. And so we model uh, every home um, from plans, if we can uh, um, get hold of them, especially with a new build, it's nice and simple. And, and that model takes into account the angle to north, uh, pitch of the roof, weather data from the local area, any shading from any trees. And we can create really accurate data of how many kilowatts um, the system will produce annually, on average per month, and average um, per day as well. And so it's really accurate. We're expecting this system to cover kind of 70 plus percentage of demand of the home um, and so that's something around uh, six to eight thousand kilowatt hours a year um, net result for the homeowner which should be um, a dramatically reduced bill i imagine their power will be something like 20 to 30 percent um, of what it would be without solar and a battery so here we have the connection to the tesla gateway is showing us live data from the solar production, the loading in the house, and the state of charge of the power wall. This is showing right now that the solar is powering everything inside the house and the excess has been directed into the power wall to charge it. Yeah, we're, on a sunny day we're producing in winter, short days but sunny we're producing 10 kilowatts. Um, and the battery can store yeah, 13 and a half. So, you know, in winter we can charge that battery, use the solar to um, kind of take care of any of our energy, small energy needs in the middle of the day. And then obviously at night when everyone gets home, we use that battery. And then another thing we're actually incorporating is on our energy contract. We get free power for a time period and we just put our heating on and charge our battery. And, and then, you know, being a passive house and being so airtight uh, and energy efficient, that heat just doesn't evaporate once the heating's off. So, yeah, it's a bit of a win-win at the moment. So we've got a 24 hour period here, um, a midnight to midnight. Above the line is demand the battery discharging or solar production. We've got three colors, blue for the battery, yellow for the solar, and red for grid. In the early morning, the battery's discharging and meeting the demand of the household. Up until the grid's helped out a little bit, you can see this red spike here. The demand at that moment in time is higher than the battery can discharge, and so it's working in combination. At about nine o'clock in the morning, the sun's come up, um, and the solar has, has had enough power to cover the loads in the home. And so it's reversed and the, and the battery here has started charging up again. In the later afternoon, once the battery's got up to 100%, because it's grid tied, solar then exports to the grid and you get paid a small amount from your energy retailer. Um, a little bit of extra help um, to cover the return on investment. Um, the reverse happens when the sun sets, battery's discharging again, couple little periods where the grids helped out again demand at that period of time has been a little bit higher than the peak output of the battery um, and then at nine o'clock here um, time-based control has, uh, has happened and so the battery knows right I've got free power I'll charge from the grid again but I'll also cover the load in the home so in a 24-hour period we've, we've we've taken a little bit of grid power here in the early morning probably breakfast 
a little bit of grid power here. Um, well, probably while having dinner, but um, in effect, off grid for 23 hours of the day, something like that, and with a, 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 a cost to the client, uh, probably net zero. A um, little bit of cost from drawing the grid here and here, but have exported some power here, so probably dollar value about a zero. So far, I'm just stoked on the performance. It's better than um, than I thought, and also I'm stoked on like what we achieved in the design and how we fell short of passive house, and we have a small heating demand in winter. But that's already very small, like um, hundred dollars a month including electric, it's a fully electric house, so, and that we have a very, very low 1% overheating in summer, so I'm looking forward to seeing how that goes. I'm just stoked on the comfort, the performance, the modeling is accurate, um, and, and yeah, like, it's, it, the numbers don't, don't lie, so. Yeah, it's been pretty awesome to, to live in it and experience it and it's freezing outside you open that door and it's just like Poof, and you just don't want to leave <laughs> from what we've learned is it is worth striving for that passive house principle and incorporating those five principles into your build um, you don't necessarily have to achieve the standard but using all of all of those five things and modeling your home is going to make a huge difference to your comfort and a huge difference to the environment and a huge difference to the longevity of the building um, and if you're thinking of these things from the start um, it's going to pay off in, in the comfort in the, in the long run so yeah even if you don't get to the passive house standard but you've worked to it, you're going to have a home, you know, five times better than, than most in New Zealand.